What's up, Eagles Nation? What's going on, NFL world? How you doing, division rivals? This is Steven Heider with Gate City Sports Channel, the sports channel where the cerebral NFL fan comes for about 10 minutes of daily content. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Whatever time it is when you finally get around to watching this video, my name is Steven Heider, and this is Gate City Sports Channel. Look, if you're a new viewer of this channel, if I could ask you to do a huge favor, look, by the end of this video, if you decide, hey, I like this content, I like the way this guy's presenting the information, and I love the fact that, that he puts in a lot of research about what's going on, then do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, people. You have no clue how much that helps, guys. It keeps YouTubers motivated to push out videos, guys. To all my OG subscribers, you already know what I'm going to ask you to do. Go ahead and hit that thumbs up button, guys. That's how we communicate with YouTube to let YouTube know this is a community that converses back and forth and reacts to videos. And in return, YouTube will then take this video and push it out across the platform. All right, y'all. I'm excited to bring you a very important topic to me today. I think this is a topic, guys. I'm going to be quite honest. I think it's being slept on. I don't think it's getting the amount of coverage it deserves. And it's an important topic. What the hell are we going to do about Malcolm Jenkins? This is not some, oh, easy topic that's easily solved. Not a big deal. We either sign him or we don't know, guys. This has big ramifications for the Eagles. This move can literally change the entire dynamic of the back seven of the Philadelphia Eagles. That's today's question, guys. We really got to dig down into the contract of my Malcolm Jenkins. Where does he rank amongst these safeties? Is he being compensated fairly? We got to talk about his age. We got to talk about that productivity because that goes along with your age, availability, all those things. And I've got a couple of unique things. You know I'm always going to throw a little twist in here, guys. So be ready for some film study today, guys. As I promise you, I'm going to take you back to 2017. And I'm going to talk about a pivotal change that happened during that 2017 season that has carried out and played its way out from 2018 and 2019. The question I'm going to pose to you right now before we get into the video is this. Has Jim Schwartz always been a single high safety guy? Or might that have been an adaptation that happened during the 2017 season and we haven't turned back since? Think about it, y'all. All right, here we go. All right, guys, for full transparency, I should probably come out and, and be quite open and honest that I, look, I'm a big Malcolm Jenkins fan, okay? Anytime that I get a guy like Nigel Bradham, I get a guy like Malcolm Jenkins where I'm a huge fan of, I know how important they were to the success we had in 2017. Guys, I, I try to be very mindful of what I say and how I'm analyzing things because it's easier to use, you know, like a, a bias in your opinion of that. In my opinion, Malcolm Jenkins saved this organization from the depths of safety despair because we went through the ringer trying to identify talent. We thought we had a couple of guys and it didn't quite work out. And I mean, after b Doc, it really took till we got Malcolm Jenkins to really iron this position out. So, and I know that saying that, you know, Malcolm Jenkins played strong, Brian played free. Nonetheless, they were both kind of in the box guys. So, you know. When I look at this, you know, if the issue is about money, then I need to see the money. So I went to go find out who were the highest paid safeties. And the way the contracts broke down was that Malcolm Jenkins was the 10th highest paid safety according to USA Today. And I will admit some of their numbers don't make some sense to me because it looks like Malcolm Jenkins' number is a little lower than they're quoting, personally, from what I can see. But we'll get to that in a second. If you look at that list, you can see the guys there in the top five. Okay, I mean, these are guys that you probably would have kind of expect. I mean, you got um, Kevin Bird out there in Tennessee. He's the highest paid safety at $14.1 million. You got um, Tyran Mathieu over there in Kansas City at $14 mil. You got Landon Collins in Washington at $14 mil. Earl Thomas in Baltimore at $13.75 mil. And then Rashad Jones out in Miami at $12 mil. So, look. We all know that when you're a certain level, if you're if you're a certain level of football player, it doesn't matter if you say, well, you know, Tyron Matthew is, is he's a better football player. Matthew is a better football player than like Jenkins. Like, irregardless, they're both very good football players. And whoever comes up next for that contract is going to be the top guy. It's just the way it works. 
I didn't realize that Jenkins' salary was this low. I thought it was higher than this. I didn't think he was that far off of the top guys. When you get into the specifics of it, because he ranked 10th, when you get into the specifics of his contract, it's even worse because his salary goes down this season if we option him. And he really didn't make any money. He wasn't making that much money, guys, until last season. And even then, he was really lagging behind players that, from 6 to 10, you can make arguments he's probably a better football player than. I think even at Rashad Jones in Miami, you could probably make a better case that Malcolm Jenkins is a much better football player than him. But I, I could see, you know, uh, Bird out there in Tennessee, Mathieu out there in Kansas City, and Thomas in Baltimore. Hey, look, I, I think you're getting argumentative there if you're trying to say, you know what I mean, that Malcolm Jenkins, like, not this point in the career. I mean, he might be a better overall football player, but he's 32. So you got to keep that in mind. Um, those three guys, I kind of understand having those contracts above Malcolm Jenkins. You know, when you get into the Landon Collins, I'd rather have Malcolm Jenkins, to be quite honest. When you get into Rashad Jones, I'd rather have Malcolm Jenkins, to be quite honest. With that said, let's take a look at his numbers, guys, and, and I'll show you this perspective of why Malcolm Jenkins is so pissed off about the circumstances surrounding the, this contract. Guys, if we remember correctly, when the Eagles signed Malcolm Jenkins back in 2014, this was not a signing that people liked because it was an originally a three-year deal. But man, he proved to be much better than what Jeff McLean thought. Because Jeff McLean put a lot of opinion out there. You know, pulling stats from PFF, which I told you, I thought PFF, out of all these organizations, I think they do some things very well. Don't get me wrong. But... I think they're very arbitrary, very arbitrary in their player grades. And he was pointing out stuff from PFF from 2012 and 2013 at the safety position saying, you know, Malcolm Jenkins was the worst or the second to worst. And then when he got to Philadelphia, you can kind of see sometimes PFF is just full of shit. Um, with that said, wasn't a very exciting player, but he lived out that contract. He played very well. And then he got that extension. So. Let's take a look at what happened starting in 2016 with his contract, which was a big deal. And it didn't quite live up to the value that I'm pretty sure Jenkins was hoping. So at the time, he was only 28 years old, guys. And let's go over the contract notes first. So Malcolm Jenkins signed a four-year, $35 million contract with the Eagles, including $7.5 million signing bonus and $21 million guaranteed. And an average annual salary of $8.75 million, which I think is where they were getting that figure from, guys. In 2020, Jenkins will earn a base salary of $7.6 million, that's this season, guys, and a roster bonus of $250,000, while carrying a cap hit of $10.887 million and a dead cap value of $6.111 million. So, obviously, that's that team option because you can cut him now at a savings. So, let's look at the... Contract notes at the bottom, $16 million initial guaranteed, which is included in his signing bonus, his 2016 and 2017 salaries, guys. And then $5 million of 2018 salary is guaranteed on uh, March 18th of 2018, which that's already come and gone. A 2019 option must be exercised by the 13th, obviously it was, of March. And then 2019-2020 per game active bonuses of 15000 $625, equaling that $250,000 bonus. Basically, guys just being active, which he's been. He got that full money. Um, in 2018, they converted $7.685 million of a salary into a bonus. And in 2020, which is where we're currently sitting, guys, the club must option and exercise his contract, which is the impasse we currently find ourselves in, right? Is the fact is, are the Eagles going to option him or are they going to decline the option and will Ma malcolm jenkins show up if they do option the contract when he has stated he will not play on that contract obviously 2021 and 2022 those years are voided out so let's take a look at what this salary was guys let's start with the cap hit and then we'll get into the nitty-gritty of the of the contract in 2016 it was 5.66 million chump change guys 2017, 7.5 million. That's probably when the contract escalated a little bit. 
But then you come down here to 2018, and because they converted a lot of that money over to the signing bonus and stuff like that, guys, it was $3.9 million on the cap. If you go to 2019, this was the contract year that he, you know, he got paid the most here, $11.3 million. I think that was fair market value for him, but you see the yearly cash value of that is actually only $8.3 million. That's the figure I would have used if I was USA Today, but they used that 8.75 average, I think is where they went with it. And now in 2020, his cap hit is $10.8 million, but his cash value is only really $7.85 million. So how are they getting these figures, guys? Well, you go to that base salary of 7.6. And you go to that roster bonus of the $250,000 and you come out, you should come out with that 7.85 figure. Okay. You go to this yearly base salary of 8.1, put in that option of that $250,000 roster bonus, and you got 8.35 million, guys. You guys get how these contracts are working. Base salary of 915000 right? Because it all got kind of tied up in that signing bonus, right? That $1.5 million restructuring and that $1.5 million signing bonus. And that comes out to your 3.952 million cap hit, okay? But you can see this one, it's a little misleading because he had a cash value of 8.6, right? Because you saw they diverted like, I don't know what it was, like 7 million, right? Towards the actual like signing bonus or something like that, guys. So that's why that figure came out that way. Here you get the cash value of 6 million, came off that base salary, okay? That's how these contracts work. This is what Nigel, or not Nigel, but I'm sorry, guys. This is what Malcolm Jenkins is facing. This is the contract situation. I don't honestly blame him for saying I'm not playing on this. I'm just not going to play on that number. I think he was compensated probably a little under the market value of what he was last year. But nonetheless, like it wasn't ridiculous. This season, I think he's got a legitimate right to say this is ridiculous. I'm not playing on that number. The question now remains, what are the Eagles going to do? What is... What are the Eagles going to do without Malcolm Jenkins? And, and I think we need to take a look at the evolvement, like the way that we evolved as a defense. And I think it's time we go into some film study, guys, and let's talk about the evolution of the Philadelphia Eagles defense in 2017 and what happened, all right? So let's roll into some film. You can see here the Eagles are in that cover three single high safety with Jenkins in the box as a sand. This is the basis of what I consider the Jim Schwartz cover three defense, okay? We play a lot of this on first downs, all right? We, we kind of go between a lot of single high coverage, between cover three, cover one. We do mix in some cover two here and there, guys. All right. You'll see the Eagles get a little creative at times, so we don't always, like, we'll do things like we'll we'll have a big nickel, right? Uh, so we'll go into, like, a quasi-dime kind of package, but it's really a big nickel. So you're really playing one linebacker on the field, and you got a safety in there alongside with Malcolm Jenkins. So we did that a lot when we had Sandejo. But... This is a staple of Jim Schwartz's defense here since the change in 2017. And it's a single high safety cover three. You got both your corners playing a third of the field, and you got your deep safety playing a third of the field. The idea and the concept behind this is, is that everything should be in front of those three football players. Nothing should get behind them. Unfortunately for the Eagles, sometimes it gets behind them. All right. When you look at this defense, go to that second level, the linebacker level. You got Malcolm Jenkins essentially up at the line of scrimmage playing like a Sam backer type positioning. Sam, because he's he's playing towards the strong side of the offensive line there. You got your Mike, which is Nigel Bradham. And you got your Will, which at this point was Zach Brown. He was playing the Will, okay? You got uh, Nickel out there and Avante Maddox. And then you got your defensive line adjustments. So you got a wide nine technique going on. So that's with Barnett. You got, uh, looks like... Uh, Malik Jackson playing with, I called it a one technique, guys, but really and honestly, that's called a zero shade technique. And this is a strategy the Eagles like to employ to try to get one-on-one -on -one blocking assignments with the offensive line. So you're trying to force them into, if they slide protect, you're probably going to send a linebacker or a safety kind of blitzing. If they try to go, you know, if they, if they stay put and they're just blocking who's in front of them, then you're looking to get a one-on-one -on -one matchup with like either Brandon Graham or you're trying to get it with Fletcher Cox or, you know, you're trying to get that one-on-one -on -one matchup. You could also see like a guy like uh, Barnett crash inward from that wide nine. He can crash inward, taking that tackle. And then you got a guy like the Will who can then blitz. He can come around on that outside. So this is what we've seen from the Philadelphia Eagles for the past couple of seasons. 
But things weren't always this way. And the key to this defense had to deal with two players, okay? You got Nigel Bradham, who primarily played on the outside. He played a lot of will, to my surprise, actually, when I was looking back in 2017, which shocks me because I think he's a natural Sam, but he was playing a lot of will. He's in as the mic, and you got, you know, uh, your safety coming down playing that Sam positioning in Malcolm Jenkins. The problem here is you lose both these players. You may lose the versatility you have to run this particular scheme with a certain level of efficiency and effectiveness. And that lies the problem with Malcolm Jenkins and this contract situation right now. So I want to take you back in time, and I'm going to show you the opening play of the 2017 season and the way the Eagles actually lined up for that play. You guys notice the difference in the defensive alignment from the Eagles in 2017? All right, guys, in 2017, in the first play of the season, once again against the Washington Redskins, ironically, we come out again in a sub package just like we did in 2019. This time, it's not because our sub package is becoming our, essentially our, our main package here. It's because of the matchup that Washington presents. It comes out in four wide receiver set. So because they're running a spread, we come out in a nickel cover to two deep safety kind of sub package here. The Eagles played a lot of cover two in 2017 until a pivotal moment in the season happened, and I'll get to that, I'll get to that in a second. But if you look at the defensive alignment, there are some pretty interesting things going on here. Number one, we're in a two deep, right? So you got Jenkins as your strong, and you got McLeod as your free. So Jenkins is playing more towards the field side on this one. So he's uh, to the defensive left, offensive right. And then you got McLeod is on the basically the, the boundary side. So he's on the offensive left, defensive right. Now, if you look down at your linebacker alignments, you you know, because we are in a sub package, there's only two linebackers on the field. But it's interesting that our Sam is Michael Kendricks and he's on the field. Our Mike <laughs> happens to be uh, Hicks and he's on the field. But you noticed who's out in this sub package. Nigel Bradham. And that's a difference. He played a lot of our base 43. And we played a lot of base that season. But in our sub packages, he was out. Now, look at the corners. You got Jalen Mills up in like a man press kind of situation on one side. And then you got Ronald Darby in an off coverage man on the other side. Okay, you got your nickel out there. And then you got a different defensive front alignment from what I showed you on the, you know, 2019 season open. So you got a five technique, a five technique, my bad guys, being run by both defensive ends, okay? And you got three techniques coming out of both defensive tackles. This is a much different sub-package football team. This is a different defense and a different style, okay? This doesn't look the same. And by the way, I'm going to roll this clip one more time for you guys to see. For people who keep saying that um, essentially, you know, Jay Gruden wasn't a good play caller in Washington, I disagree. I think he was a pretty damn good play caller. I just think he lacked talent. But I'm going to show you, for you young kids, you want to know how you attack cover two? Watch this play design. It's exactly how you attack cover two defenses. What... I recognize more than anything, guys, about the 2017 season when I broke it down was this. There's a general trend on the NFL because of offensive frequency with personnel usage in the 11 man and like 10 man and other wide receiver sets where you're calling wide receiver heavy to be, you know, teams playing a little more frequently inside of their sub packaged defenses. OK, so. A lot of sub packages are really becoming your your base packages and there's not a whole lot to distinguish between a 34 and a 43 front anymore other than really and honestly if your hands in the dirt if you're in a joker position like there's just not it's not as big as a difference as it used to be with that said there were some differences in the way the eagles play number one they did play a little more in their base packages they still were heavily in the nickel and the dime up to 70 percent of snaps basically but what I did notice was they did still play a lot of three by three, you know, down, you know, three linebacker sets, I should say, some some base, some 43 base. 
and prior to you know the the Philadelphia Eagles going through Jordan Hicks's injury situation when we went into that sub package we generally used Michael Kendricks and we used Hicks in that nickel or in that you know dime it obviously would keep Hicks in if we went to the dime sometimes Kendricks but kind of situation guys so there was a a difference in the way this Philadelphia Eagles defense operated. They played a lot more cover too. Not that they didn't play single man high safety, but there were a lot of differences. Number one, I saw Malcolm Jenkins being utilized as the high safety more in 2017 than I've seen in 2018 and 2019. Um, if you go back and look at games like Kansas City, you'll see that, uh, like uh, Kansas City and San Diego, you'll see that the Eagles would basically, instead of going into a nickel sometimes, what they would do is just they would stick into that base package. And, you know, they would basically drop down Rodney McLeod to cover the slot. There's a little more versatility to the defense back then. But go to the playoffs and you start to see a shift happening in 2017. The two divisional rounds when the Eagles came out and they opened up, the you know, on defense, their drives. I did notice that the Eagles were still playing base. Uh, one game they had LRB at the mic, and the other game they had Najee Good at the mic. And then basically from there, you had Nigel Bradham playing your Sam, and it looked like they flipped Kendricks over to the Will. But nonetheless, they were playing a lot out of base. But what I did notice was they started playing single high safety even in the base, and they were dropping Jenkins down in the box. By the time you reach the Super Bowl, first snap of the Super Bowl, you see cover three. The switch is on to our first down defense becoming cover three. What I did notice was when you go back and you look at the 2017 season, there was a switch from us being in base package on first down and also in sub package being cover two to a little more towards the end of 2017 and in definitely 2018 and 2019, you see single high coverage with the evolution becoming that cover three single high with Malcolm Jenkins playing the Sam dropping down in the box. To me, it looks like that definitely began with the Super Bowl. The question really is, you lose Malcolm Jenkins, and you now that we've lost Bradham, you got to redesign the defense now. Now we might be talking about a schematic change in the defensive frequency in which we play certain formations. How often we're in cover two given, you know, safety help to these corners how much we may be playing press or playing off coverage how often we might be playing man versus zone i think we've always been kind of a zone coverage system with shorts but i do think you could see a, a you know a shake up there these are the things that make this move with malcolm jenkins so important all right y'all that's my spiel for today i'm gonna go ahead and flip it around and i'm gonna turn the questions back on you guys and let's roll into the questions of the day all right, ladies and gents, questions of the day. So this was a big topic I just threw in your lap. Granted, I recognize that. But I wanted to give you the full perspective of what I was seeing. Why I kept trying to tell you guys that I thought that the secondary and especially the safeties in particular were very closely associated to what we do at the linebacker position. I don't think it's any secret that in 2017, we threw out probably one of the most talented linebacking crews We've had with Hicks playing the middle, Kendricks playing an outside, whether that was the Will or the Sam. And then you had Bradham playing either the Will or the Sam. It was a very talented group of linebackers. Okay. We had Joe Walker that season. We ended up signing uh, uh, Danielle Ellerby later on in the season. Like there was a group of talented players there. We haven't really seen that since that period. And no secret in 2017, after that season, two of the things we allowed to happen was we allowed Hicks to walk in free agency and Kendricks to go. Of course, Kendricks ended up getting hit with the insider trading, and there was a lot of uncertainty surrounding him when he went to Cleveland at first, but whole another story, whole another day. My questions to you are this. Knowing all this information I just presented to you, do you think the Eagles should give Malcolm Jenkins a new contract? Because let's be honest. The two biggest pieces to that transition we made defensively in the coverage scheme 
and the way we started running a lot of single high safety had a lot to do with Malcolm Jenkins, had a lot to do with Nigel Bradham. You can argue that Rodney McClough played a pretty big role in that as well, but those two guys in particular were the two who were asked to play a little different role. Jenkins coming into the box, being much more like a Sam linebacker recently, and then, of course, Bradham being asked to leave the outside linebacker position and filling in the mic. Bradham's already gone, and the threat is looming above us that Jenkins could be gone. Where do you stand on this contract situation? I gave you the numbers. I gave you all that detail. Number two, do you think the Eagles are on the verge of a schematic change to the coverage scheme? Could we be seeing a renewed interest in the linebacker position? Where are we going to find these pieces to fit what we were doing in terms of safety play, linebacker play, corner play? If you have weaker, more exposed corners, you're going to need to provide safety help. Could you see the Eagles playing a little more cover two? Or do you think you're going to see the continuation of cover one and cover three and predominant packages for the Philadelphia Eagles? And we're going to find players to fit that mold. Third question. What are your thoughts about the future of the Eagles linebacker and safety core for the 2020 season? Do you have particular players in mind that match the scheme you just threw out there? Who are the guys that you're envisioning? And I'll give you a hint. When I get into the safety play, that's coming up, guys, because I have to define what I think the future will hold for the Eagles before I can really give you guys targets because certain players fit certain scheme coverages a little better than others. So, all right, guys, that's what I got for you. Hope you guys enjoyed today's content. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And, oh, yeah, how do we close these videos out? We go E-A-G-L-E-S. All right, y'all, let's go Eagles.